Fisher & Paykel Healthcare has a 30-year plan. Its big picture CEO tells us how it's going to do it. All we'd really like to do, we want to stick on this track of doubling every five or six years. And it gets harder and harder and harder, you know. It's Monday the 4th of September and you're watching Markets with Madison. Lewis Graydon has worked at Fisher & Paykel Healthcare for 40 years, seven as its CEO. He's just pulled the trigger on a 100 hectare land purchase south of Auckland in Caraca, costing the company $275 million. He says it's necessary because the medical device company is going to double its global revenue every five years. Lewis is one of the most long-term thinkers I've ever interviewed. Before we started talking on camera, he warned me that he struggles with conciseness. You'll see what I mean. Lewis, lovely to meet you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. I want to start by talking about COVID, and I'm sure you're probably yeah. quite sick of this topic by now, but obviously it was a respiratory virus. You sell respiratory products, yeah. which is quite incredible. Your business yeah. was an ultimate beneficiary. Talk me through the net gain. And now that it's worn off and you can look at it, how much do you think Fisher & Paykel Healthcare ultimately benefited from it? Amazingly complex question to try and answer quickly. Um, I think probably, you know, if you try it, there's lots and lots of gains and benefits, but if you drill down, our business is about changing clinical practice. We have a therapy and, and uh, our business is about saying if you use this therapy, compared to what you currently do, you'll get a better result for patients, for caregivers, and ultimately lower cost of delivering that healthcare, changing clinical practice. And uh, what happened during COVID, uh, huge demand for all of our respiratory therapies, but some of the newer ones really jumped to the forefront and became the preferred treatment for treating COVID-19. So in terms of uh, market moving from, we used to treat patients like this, now we're treating them like that, we kind of got this massive acceleration in, in um, understanding, knowledge, and usage, you know, of uh, all of our therapies, but in particular nasal high flow therapy. I think that was the big benefit. How many years do you think COVID shaved off in terms of getting your products and increasing the understanding yeah. in hospitals globally? Really, really hard to say because, like all these things for a business, you've got kind of you've got puts and takes, pros and cons. Um, COVID got the product out there got people using it, got people knowing what the therapy is, but they were using it for COVID. So that's a bonus, and they've got the hardware, they know how to use it, they've been trained. The, on the other side of the coin, um, it can be associated for use with COVID, and that was three or four years of us not working with our customers to change clinical practice for not COVID. So that's the long answer. The short answer is we don't really know yet. Um, we, 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 we think it's solidly an acceleration because at least the customers have the hardware, they know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And now that they have it, right, and know how to use it, as you say, do you think they're now going to order it again and potentially maintain? We can kind maintain? of see that coming through. It's to what extent, so it's about they've got the hardware, they've got our products, it's about what patients will they use it on. And if you look at, uh, we talk about patients treated, and if you look at nasal high, throw, high flow, 2019 before COVID, I think there was about 3 million patients treated, and um, that was out of about 50 million that would benefit. If you look at 2023, the uh, year we've just finished, um, that was about 6 million patients treated out of the 50 million that would benefit. So you can see there's been some progress through there, not a lot of COVID around the world in FY23. So you can see, you know, we are making progress with the change in clinical practice for not COVID. Internally, what was the mindset when COVID happened and this demand absolutely spiked for your products? How did it feel? It's really hard because you're actually casting your mind back. Um, you're casting your mind back. It's over three years now, isn't it? Four years. 2020. I've lost count, Lewis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> About that. The years have sort of merged. Um, so, and, and you know, when you cast your mind back, you've got to try and be honest. So I'd say a little bit of panic uh, originally. What does this mean for humanity? And then uh, a massive, I'd say, sense of responsibility. When you look at these respiratory therapies, we're 70 to 80% of the world's supply. And so, um, you know, I don't mean to sound big headed or anything about it, but we did think, geez, this rests on us. Uh, what we can make is patients treated. Uh, everything we can make this week is someone treated next week. So um, it's a little bit frightening. Uh, it, it, it felt like a really, really big uh, responsibility at the time. Uh, but I think we're in a, uh, we're in a 
good position and that we do plan ahead for growth, so we could do that. Um, while it's uh, frightening and a responsibility, it's also um, fulfilling to be, you know, to think that everything I do today potentially saves a life tomorrow. So I think, you know, people, um, you know, people did long, long hours. People did whatever was required. Uh, but I think on the whole, we felt pretty good about it. What else fundamentally changed in the business in terms of manufacturing capacity, research and development spend? So it's all those kinds of things. I mean, again, we can go on for a couple of hours about what fundamentally changed. Um, I, I, I'd say those were kind of superficial things. So we went with, throughout the COVID, we said we'll need to make as much as we possibly can and we'll grow our manufacturing capacity as hard and fast as we possibly can. And we're going to keep doing that until we're absolutely certain that things have stabilised. Uh, so manufacturing capacity, buildings, uh, manufacturing equipment, all those kinds of things. Um, we were accelerating those right through to probably about the beginning of this year. We still had pedal to the metal. Um, I think a lot of other fundamentals have changed or improved or been reinforced in the culture and in the business. Um, we've kind of moved the bar for what we're capable of and what we think we can do. That's kind of moved all around. Um, we've certainly learned how to um, efficiently and effectively manage uh, strange things and urgent things. Um, um, our bar for what we consider as a crisis has gone got considerably higher, I would say, since COVID. I bet. You've proved that point. Yeah, 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 yeah. You call it a bit of a sort of supply at all costs mentality, right? Yeah. I can imagine that at that point there was not much sight on margins, on profits. It was just get the goods out the door to the people that need them, right? Yeah. Do you feel like you lost sight of them completely or was that just not the time to have sight on them We anyway? didn't worry about it. It wasn't worth worrying about it. The mentality at the time was uh, a product shipped as a life saved. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not, that's not about money when you're in that position. And I think it does come back to, you know, this is a financially robust business. It is a strong business. And uh, from that strong base, it allows you to take that approach. Now that lives have been saved, yeah. some of them anyway, yeah. do you feel like you need to refocus that? On product, yeah. on profits and margins. Well, this is this is one of the, uh, the you know very topical things, um, and we talked about it in our shareholders meeting. And that is, if you look at our business, we've made continual improvements in gross margin and our profitability year after year after year, and we do that with thousands and thousands of continuous improvement projects, mostly small, but all adding up to something material. And if you look back in our history, you can see it happening. So, of course. We've just had three years where we didn't do that, three years where we just tried to get as much out the door as possible at any cost, and our gross margins declined. And the topic of the moment, topic du jour, is uh, we need to get gross margin back to where it was, back to our target, 65%. And we think we can do that, and we think the most long-term uh, sustainable thing we can do is don't divert resources onto improving gross margin, just go back to those continuous improvements and based on our history, and it's business as usual, it's what we normally do, go back to that behaviour. And if you look back at our history, you know, you'd be looking at three, four, maybe even five years, and then gross margin should be back where it was. Now, you don't make and sell appliances, even though I'm sure many New Zealanders might think that you do. Do you get Sometimes, that question a lot? Occasionally, yes. We sell, things, we sell equipment that goes on the ventilator, and what we do is what goes between the ventilator and the patient. We condition the gas that a ventilator is providing to a patient in intensive care. Uh, we sell the thing that goes on non-invasive ventilators to connect it to the patient and condition the gas that goes to the patient. In nasal high flow, yes, we do sell. We have the machine and the whole therapy set in nasal high flow. And all those things I've described can be used across adult and neonatal. And then you stray into home care, and that's where you stray to your sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, and uh, sort of home care respiratory support versions of those therapies. Okay, perfect. Got it. Yeah. You sell those at 120 countries, and yes. I believe last year you sold them to 20 million patients, or at least those products were used on 20 million patients globally. Out of that, you know, that 20 million, how many more millions do you think are out there that you can help? If you just go to the top line uh, in hospital, we would say the total market or patients annually that would benefit from our therapies, that's over 150 million patients a year. Wow. And if you go to the home care part of our business, that's over 100 million patients a year. So I think one of the stories uh, for our business is that we are active in markets that are large and we're active in markets that are underpenetrated. And it's because we're changing clinical practice 
we talk about market size in terms of patients that would benefit. That's an enormous opportunity. How are you going to capture it? Oh, well, it's what this business has been doing for 50 years. Um, and it is about maintaining um, a product and therapy offering that improves outcomes. I mean, we say it over and over and over, and that, that is the reality. Why Fisher & Paykel Healthcare? Why should hospitals use your products as opposed to competitors? Uh, so this comes back to um, quite probably uh, we're changing clinical practice and we'll be leading that change with what we do. We eventually have competitors come along behind us. But again, it comes back to at the end of the day, well, you're treating patients like this with maybe nas nasal cannula and two liters per minute. If you treat patients like that using these therapies, um, we will say, here's the clinical outcomes you can get. Patients are less likely to get worse or are more likely to leave the hospital sooner. That costs less, you know, there's the benefit for you, they're easy to use, less training. So we'll be pointing to the benefits on, on one practice versus another practice. The competitors tend to appear later on in the piece. Talk me through that process from having a new product, doing clinical studies and getting it to market. How intensive is that, is, is that and what's required? Well, if you, if you look at, uh, you know, the opportunities we have and, you know, the, 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 the available market would see us, you know, doubling the size of our business every five or six years for at least 30 years. There's certainly, you know, that opportunity. And if you look, we've been talking about most things on there for 20 years. These are quite long time frame things. And if you want to start at the very, very beginning, it is about having a concept, having an idea. It is about uh, making some prototypes, measure, measuring a physiological outcome, maybe a mechanisms of action. What's this thing doing? What's this therapy doing? Then moving on to you know, outcome studies. All the way along learning things and constantly evolving the therapy. And you know, you're talking 20, 30 year journeys. If you look at um, invasive ventilation, that's where this business started. Humidifiers for invasive ventilation, that's where this business started. You know, in terms of patients treated with that therapy, we probably 60 to 70% penetrated globally. That's after 50 years. And in terms of um, product evolution, I'm really struggling to remember now. We're probably on, in terms of evolving the therapy itself and improving the therapy, we might be on version 10 or something like that by now. Wow. Research and development, obviously very critical for this company. Yeah. How much effort do you place on that and, and how much money is appropriate to spend on that? If you could give me an number. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the thinking is, is that we want to build a business that will grow profitably and sustainably over the long term. So when we look back at our history, you know, we do have the benefit of being able to look back over 50 years. Um, roughly speaking, the history has been 9 or 10% of revenue, somewhere around there, is, is an R&D spend that one, we can sustain for a very long time, and two, historically, has driven that doubling every five or six years. You're very clearly a long-term thinker. I don't think you've mentioned anything annually or even sort of within two years in this conversation, nor in many others I've heard you, and it's always five years minimum, if not at least 20 or more likely 30 years. How many years ahead are you thinking when you make decisions for the business today? We kind of have a roadmap. We've talked about some of the opportunities. We know what the opportunities are, and we have a good idea of at least the process we need to follow to get there. And when you say long-term, I think the challenge is really about just staying on that roadmap. When you could see things, well, we could do this and we'd get a better result this year. Mm -hmm. We could do this and it'll be better over the next two years. We could do that and it'll be cheaper for the next five years. The challenge, the long-term part, is staying on the, on, the, on the roadmap that you've got that ultimately leads to you know, realising the opportunity. That's what we think about when we think about and talk about long-term. Um, I don't know how to answer your question. I think the key word is discipline. It does take dis gross margin right now is not where we want to be. We could take half our R&D workforce and we could say work on cost out for 12 months and uh, we could have our gross margin at 65% you know, in a year or two rather than waiting for a five years. And you can see the cost there. Uh, that gives us a better result maybe next year. Uh, but we've taken R&D out for... 12 months or half of R&D out for 12 months that puts us further away from the long-term objective. So it's about making those kinds of trade-offs, I think. And I don't know how to answer your question. 
it, You've answered it, it, it very comes well. down to keeping your eye on where you want to go and resisting the short-term temptations. When you eye what Fisher & Paykel Healthcare could look like in 30 years' time, do you have a picture in your mind of what it's like, what it's doing? What we'd really like to do, we want to stick on this track of doubling every five or six years. And it gets harder and harder and harder, you know. Going from $100 million a year to $200 million a year seems impossible. Going from $10 million a year to $20 million a year seems pretty tough. Uh, when you're talking about a billion, it just constantly, you know, I think it's challenging enough just staying on this track. Let's try and just keep doubling every five or six years. I want to talk about Caraca, 105 hectares. What's the plan there? Are you going to have people live there? Are you going to move down there? Well, what's that going to be like? <laughs> so you can see the beautiful site we're on now. It's huge. Yeah. This well, is this enormous. Site, this is a hunt. Well, this is 40 hectares, okay. this site. And this site will cope with five buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, we're building the fifth and final building now. Um, and when it's complete, this site would uh, house maybe 7,000 people. or well, not house. This site would have 7,000 people working on it. Uh, and Caracas is just taking that long-term plan, taking it out 30 years. We need about 100 hectares that should accommodate us in New Zealand, uh, reproducing this model over about a 30-year time frame. And Caracas would cope with, with about uh, 12 buildings versus the five we have here. Wow. So pretty much double this. That's on the 30-year trajectory. It's a doubling, doubling, doubling. So that's how dedicated you are to achieving this doubling and growth. Well, you kind of have to. If you don't plan for it, it doesn't happen. To the, point, to, to the point where you're genuinely thinking about office space that far ahead and you're putting $275 million down to ensure it happens. That's, that's Well, incredible. again, that comes back to it's the most efficient way of doing it. We could have said, let's do 40 hectares, 40 hectares, 40 hectares, uh, you know, every five years, you know, five to 10 years. But that's really disruptive. And that means we end up with four campuses scattered and they steadily get further and further away. So if you look at the end result you're aiming at, um, getting the 100 hectares right now is the most effective straight line way to end up where you want. Although you've front loaded some cost, you know, we'll be carrying the cost of that land for 30 years before it's fully utilised. But in terms of management time, management effort, management planning, the final result, it's the best outcome. A stake in the ground, to say the least, quite literally. Literally. But I mean, from, from our way of thinking, it's, um, that's what we'd like to end up with, and that's the straightest line to get there. You've been here for 40 years, is that correct? Yes, 40 years this year. It's a while. Yeah. Do you think you'll be here when Fisher & Paykel Healthcare becomes that 30-year vision? I you going to say vision? another, another, <laughs> I say another 40. I'm Only 30 more. I'm not going to put 40 on you. But you obviously, you're, you're making decisions for that 30-year well, time. Well, we are right? realising that 30-year yeah. vision. Yeah. We have. That's our history. Yeah. And will, will, you, will you be here to see it, staying do you on track. Will you be in the company to see well, it? Well, we kind of see it every year. Uh, you know, this... I don't know how to answer that question either, but you know, we kind of see it every year. That's the track we've been on. I'm just describing staying on the track, um, but obviously with steadily bigger and bigger numbers. But we think what we've done is reproducible and scalable. Yeah. Are you almost irreplaceable at this point? Um, well, I think that's not the way the business works. Uh, I, look, I really am honestly one of a team, and that is how it works. Not irreplaceable. Look, I think if I didn't turn up for 12 months, not a heck of a lot would change, to be honest. Thank you so much for your time, Lois. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Madison. It's worth noting that the market hasn't really priced in all of Lewis's growth plans. Some of the analysts I spoke to who cover Fisher & Paykel said while Rev should double in the next five-year period, they're uncertain if the company can consistently keep that up. They're not doubting it can do it, but rather that the world is an uncertain place and anything could disrupt it, as COVID proved. Let me know what you think of Lewis's leadership. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.